Welcome in, everyone, another edition of Sports Medicine Weekly on this Saturday morning. I'm Steve Cashel, Chicago Bulls radio host, so happy to be joined by my usual co-host. He's here in the chair once again, Dr. Brian Cole, the head team physician for the Chicago Bulls, one of the team physicians for the Chicago White Sox, sports medicine specialist, orthopedic surgeon with Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. Dr. Cole, how are you? Doing great, Steve. It's wonderful to be back. Yeah, well, let's talk you. about uh, yeah your vacation over the holidays you, uh, boy, you went warm, then you went cold, but yeah, you went skiing in Park City, one of yeah. our favorite places on earth. I know. It's uh, near and dear to your heart uh, with a family who's been there for years. Absolutely. Yeah, so it was, it was a great trip. Uh, just if it was the first December-January transition that we've had snow in many years. It's just been some awful winters out there. Uh, but it was wonderful. Had three or four great days of snow and wasn't too cold and it wasn't too crowded. You can't ask for much more and it's a beautiful place. It is. Um, you know, I've we've talked about this in years past. I have not skied in about 20 years. I think it is 20 years. And yeah. uh, I, the last time I skied, no one was wearing a helmet. Yeah, I'll tell you, it's, it's, now that would be the exception. I mean, right? it actually looks funny when you see someone skiing without a helmet. Without it's, a helmet. It's hard to believe. I, I would, you know, I would tell you sometimes the instructors from Europe and so forth, they're occasionally are not wearing helmets, but once you get used to it, your head's warm and it's, it's the real deal. I had an episode about three years ago when I was ski, skiing with Steve and Phil Mayer. They used to be in the Olympics years ago. They're yeah. twin brothers who were, who are phenomenal skiers. Anyway, skied, you know, well beyond my ability with one of them and uh, lost it and came back hit the back of my head, split my helmet down the back. Okay? So can you imagine if I wasn't wearing a helmet, what, what would have happened? So I'm telling you, it's the real deal. That's one thing I would say is critically important. If you're going to ski, you got to wear a helmet. And you get used to it. It's great. It keeps you warm. Do most people buy their helmets or yes. do you rent them? They also rent I, well, them, right? Well, you can rent them with skis and things like that. But yes, most people will will buy them. All righty. Let's bring on our first guest to continue the conversation, Dr. Jeremy Allen, a Medicine, uh, sports medicine specialist with Midwest Orthopedics at Rush, primary care physician. Dr. Allen, how are you? I'm great, Steve. Thanks for having me. Jeremy, one of the things that's really interesting is, uh, as I alluded to, when I skied recently, there were people occasionally not wearing helmets, which is, you know, the exception rather than the rule. And I know there's some controversy as to whether or not a helmet truly reduces the chance of a concussion. But I have to imagine that the data is there that it reduces the chance of something. If it's not a concussion, maybe it's severe head injury. What's your sense of the data out there, and is there any room there to, to say, look, it's not a good thing to wear a helmet? It just would be hard to imagine. Yeah, definitely from our standpoint, we're really happy that more people are wearing helmets. It, it certainly prevents a lot of injury. Unfortunately, the data just isn't there in regards to preventing the concussions. We're seeing a, a lot more of these athletes coming in uh, just because of obviously the, the, the media attention paid to concussion. Uh, we're getting a lot more after vacations and such. But when it comes to the helmets, it'll prevent the big one, just like you talked about with your story, uh, Brian. But uh, the, the concussions right now, the helmets just aren't helping a whole lot. But that being said, if you could prevent a major injury, you would say all things being equal, wear a helmet. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Absolutely. We know for a fact these helmets are preventing major injuries. And even, let's say, hypothetically, that it doesn't prevent, you know, an injury altogether. It's certainly taking what could be a catastrophic injury and making it more of a manageable, maybe short-term injury. Yeah, I can tell you, when I fell, hit the back of my head and split my helmet, I know that would have been a whole lot worse. You know, yeah, I had a headache. Maybe I had a low, you know, so-called low-grade concussion, but uh, clearly changed the outcome of that one. Yeah, and I think I think the important thing to understand, and we certainly talk about this all the time, especially with football and such, is that the, the way that the concussion happens happens because the brain is sitting in fluid, and it's a lot of times the, the momentum that the brain takes within the, the skull that causes that type of an injury. And so the helmet, it's, it's hard to prevent that with a helmet, but certainly things like lacerations, which bleed like crazy from the head, and, and major fractures and other things that certainly can cause long-term problems are, are, are being decreased with helmet use. If you're listening to Sports Medicine Weekly on this Saturday morning, Steve Cashel, Dr. Brian Cole. Our guest is Dr. Jeremy Allen from Midwest Orthopedics at Rush talking about uh, holiday ski trips, what parents and adults uh, should know about concussions. And that's kind of the million-dollar word. I'm still trying to figure it out, even with my, with my own sons. Uh, what exactly, Doc, in your opinion, is a concussion? How do you know if one has been sustained? Yeah, in the the metaphor I use with with my patients is that a concussion is sort of like a bruise to your brain. It's obviously not like the whole chemical thing that we see going on, but when you think about it that way, it, it, it's the brain really taking on injury, getting a bruise, and and the symptoms of it a lot of times are headache and fatigue, 
trouble concentrating and and, and we really just try to get across that if you're having any of those symptoms after you take uh, some sort of fall or, or some sort of injury to really take it easy and, and make sure that it doesn't get worse. Jeremy, in, uh, if you can give me sort of a, a concise answer, if you think you have a concussion, does it require a trip to the emergency room? Can you manage this on your own? And help us differentiate. When do you go to the ER and when can you just sort of sit it out until the symptoms completely go away? The vast majority of these do not need to go to the emergency room. The warning signs we talk about, certainly if somebody's losing consciousness, going in and out of consciousness, vomiting, unable to take anything by mouth. But most of these, you're resting, and and we try to get you into the office sometime in the next, you know, 24 to 72 hours after the injury to take a look at you. Okay, bottom line, though, is completely symptom-free for at least 24 hours before you return to high-level activities. Is that fair to say? I think that's huge, especially with these these uh, recreational athletes who are, are doing things like the ski trips. Is if you if you believe that you've suffered one of these injuries, really take it easy the rest of the day because the the major catastrophic problems with a concussion is getting another one really close to the first one. Dr. Jeremy Allen, Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. Dr. Allen, thanks so much for joining us here. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Next topic here on Sports Medicine Weekly, workout supplements. First question for Dr. Cole, do you take a protein supplement before or after your workout? I know you work out a lot. I do because I do a fair amount of strengthening and conditioning, and you know you can do what you do in ter- terms of consuming good food, getting whole, whole food with protein and other things in it. But for me, I think it's not enough, when, especially when you're breaking down muscle in terms of performance and recovery. So I do use a supplement and typically I'll use a whey protein and I kind of space it out. Is that after? I do it actually. I was going to say I kind of space it out, space it out throughout the day. There's lots of science behind it, but my general philosophy is to kind of space it out throughout the day and use that as an addition to just whole food, good quality nutrition where you get protein that way as well. All right. I want to talk about amino acids supplements uh, versus protein powder. Our next guest expert on this, Jay Jacobson, uh, global Director of Education of three great brands, Optimum Nutrition, BSN, and Isopure. Hey, Jay, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, tell us the difference between taking protein powder and any of the amino acid supplements. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And as Dr. Cole mentioned, um, ideally, we want to try to get as much of our protein as we can from food, from whole food. Uh, beyond that is protein powders. And the reason being protein powders are what we call complete proteins or intact proteins. They have all the full spectrum of amino acids that our body needs for repair, rebuilding, and recovery of muscle. Beyond that, we use amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein for more specific functions. So the hierarchy is always food first, then protein supplements, then amino acids such as branch chains for more specialized use. Got it. And do uh, do many of your protein powders and supplements contain amino acid supplements on top of it, or are they typically just a whole protein? Typically just a whole protein, but we do have some specific products like our Platinum HydroWay under our, amino, our, our Optimum Nutrition line that has additional branch chain amino acids, additional glutamine for performance and recovery support. There's And the other thing, you know, we use this for the bulls, I'll tell you, they're, they will divide it up and say, okay, you know, during the day, you're going to take whey protein, but at night, you're going to do casein protein. And then there's a couple of our guys who are who will consider themselves almost vegetarians and are now, you know, deviating towards the veg, vegetable source of protein. Can you just give us an overview of, you know, is there a superior type of protein? Because it is really confusing. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and from a pure performance standpoint, from an academic standpoint, we agree that dairy proteins are the king of proteins in terms of amino acid profile supporting muscle protein synthesis. So the main difference between whey and casein, which are both dairy proteins coming from milk, um, whey protein is very fast digesting. So we like to use that post-workout or after-workout to help stop muscle breakdown and begin the recovery process quickly. And then casein protein is the slowest digesting protein. It takes about eight hours to digest. So we like that before bed. So that gives us a steady stream of amino acids to support repair and recovery while we sleep, which is really, really important because that's when the bulk of your recovery from your training takes place. Visiting with Jay Jacobson, he is the Global Director of Education of Optimum Nutrition, BSN, and Isopure. Next question, Jay, should I consume a protein shake before or after a workout? 
Great question. And the jury is actually out on that. So for the last 10, 20 years, we've said after workout, absolutely. And the reason being from a more scientific perspective, the body becomes very sensitized to specific amino acids post-training. So looking for those amino acids to support recovery. But there's also good reason to believe that there's a bigger window, uh, what we call a peri window of opportunity around muscle protein synthesis that begins about two hours pre-workout, continues during training, and then extends for a couple hours after. So most of the world today focuses on post-workout protein, which is very, very important if you're only going to take it once. But depending on when you eat your last meal, you might want to consider a protein shake a couple hours before training as well to give you a bigger window of recovery opportunity. Great stuff, Jay. Appreciate all your help and uh, continued success with everything you do with uh, Glambia, Optima Nutrition, uh, BSN, and Isopure. Thank you, gentlemen, for having me. Much appreciated. Steve, just as a side note, you know, I've mentioned my new website, Brian Cole MD, as well as our Facebook page, which is Brian Cole MD. We had an awesome contest offering a month of free Shred 415. Uh, for those of you who agreed to follow, you guys did a great job. And we randomly chosen Chrissy Chodos. So, Chrissy, you're our winner, and you will win compliments of Shred 415, one month of free classes. So, congratulations and thanks, thank you for following us on Brian Cole MD. All right, great stuff. Up next on Sports Medicine Weekly, Ask the Doctors segment. Stay with us. This is 670 The Score. Back here on this Saturday morning, Steve Cashel, Dr. Brian Cole at his Sports Medicine Weekly. Net proceeds from our show, Sports Medicine Weekly, go to support orthopedic research at Rush through the liveactivenow.org fund. Dr. Cole, I know over the holidays I want to thank you and your physician assistant, Kyle Pills, for seeing me again with my uh, shoulder. We've talked about my shoulder throughout this show in different segments. <laughs> not every, you know, not every week, but every now and then. But uh, I had my first experience ever, as you recommended, an MRI. And in my uh, long life here, I don't even want to say my age, but uh, I'm in my uh, late 50s now. Hard to believe. So I've never that, had your first MRI. First MRI ever. And can yeah. I tell you, it is so unlike anything I was ever imagining. Did you get claustrophobic? Did you no. start to lose your mind? Did you listen to music? Yes. No, I listened to the score. Okay, good. Uh, that's what, like, I'll, I'll start with that, okay, okay? okay? First of all, I felt like I was <laughs> I was in a rocket ship going to the moon. Uh, you know how Nassau goes, you know, testing what, you know. I the reception was horrible. Yeah. All right. I mean, I'm listening to the, to the talk show, and I was expecting some nice, comfortable music. You know, maybe HD in my yeah, ear. Instead, it was like do 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 do. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's very oh, loud. Oh no, and the and the MRI. It's yeah. like uh, and and Shane, our producer here, gave me a good example. It's like being in the eye of a tornado. I was yeah. expecting a completely quiet room. Now your people were incredibly professional. Yeah. it well, was so well VIP. done. You're also a VIP, Steve. So they, well, thank you. you. But now great people, and they made <laughs> you so comfortable. Um, but you do get in this machine that closes you into a yeah. claustrophobic yeah. situation a if you were like that. I'll yeah. bet. I'll yeah. bet. Um, I was. So what was what was the one thing that was so surprising to you? Having the never done sound. Okay. I sound yeah. like I'm in some sort of vacuum pressure. Yeah, that's the magnet. That's the magnet. And I'm like, what? And they say, well, that's oxygen being pumped in the room or something. There was first that. Well, then, it, but the loud, the loud sound is really coming from the magnet. I mean, how so, long have MRIs be, are, been around? Oh, gosh. I mean, 30, more, 40 years? I, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to say at least 30 years. I mean, yeah. wh- like, why, what's what the modern technology? Can I mean, we get rid of the sound? Yeah, I'm no, shocked so, at yeah. that, Dr. Yeah. Cole. Shocked. Well, you got through it, and thankfully, oh, yeah. and thankfully you didn't have anything serious. No. And we gave you an injection. Yes, you did. But and, tell me the other part. I was expecting. Still pictures from the MRI, and I saw moving video. Well, there's, there's no you when you when you click through. It's like it's like your body is being sectioned on the MRI in five millimeter segments. Okay. So if you chain them together, you get a video, but you can click through each picture individually. All right. So cause... you can, but you, you know, there's lots of ways to do it, but mostly we just click through it, and if you do it very very fast, it's like a video because it's a bunch of stills that are chained together. But I was fascinated by it, and Kyle Pills and yourself, you did a great job. I showed showed some arthritis, which I didn't know I had. I was hoping yeah. it wasn't a torn rotator, and then I did the cortisone shot, and it's a lot better. 
thankfully to you guys, but um, uh, it's, oh, it was go. really different than yeah. anything I expected. But it's a great experience, by the way, at Midwest or the Peaks at Rush. I will right. say that Appreciate because you, you guys, that. I mean, from from where to go and where to park and the professionalism, it's clean. It's it's you just feel it's a great yeah, experience. No, it really a, is. It's no fun having pain and dealing with some of these things. And yeah. one of the things that we really try to lead by is making it an, an amazing experience for someone because there's lots of ways to screw it up. And if you can get that right. Uh, it ends up probably the best way to, go to go, get a good outcome when you're taking care of a patient. So and I'm, I'm happy, glad it was I'm, good for you. I'm being facetious a bit, but it is true. I, w- did, I was thinking it was just a total peaceful <laughs> experience. No, no, it's and there's not. these noises. I'm like, and, what is this? Yeah, you should just feel good that you didn't wig out on it because some people just cannot handle it. I have to, you know, they need Valium or some type of sedative just to get through it. So I could see that. Yeah. You're a big boy. It was fun. It was fun. All right, time now, Dr. Cole, for one of our staples of the show here on Sports Medicine Weekly on The Score. It is our Ask the Doctor segment. What you do is you go to our website, sportsmedicineweekly.com, and on the homepage you can click on uh, and see that you can ask a question. Type in a question. You can also reach us on Facebook on our Facebook page, Sports Medicine Weekly, and I've got a number of really good questions here for you, Dr. Cole. First one's from Gabriel. Uh, reaches us by email saying, Dr. Cole, I had a 10X procedure down in my right knee on August 9th, 2018. I was diagnosed with patella tendinitis in October 2016. I have performed physical therapy every day. I still have discomfort in the right patella area when I'm walking, especially when going up and down stairs. It's extremely frustrating to feel this discomfort after all this time. Not sure what his question is, but yeah. what is a 10X procedure? That's my question. Well, first of all, any tendonitis is really not itis. Itis means inflammation where there's white cells and in what we call an inflammatory response. So patella tendonitis or rotator cuff tendonitis really has nothing to do with inflammation. It has more to do with blood supply and a poor blood supply to the area. So all of our tendons are made out of collagen. And when there's repetitive trauma or repetitive use, we get this condition where the collagen starts to break down a bit. So the 10X procedure is a really innovative device that can be used in the office or the operating room where it has a needle probe that's no bigger than, say, an IV needle that you would put in for an IV catheter, right, to sure. put fluids in. And you poke it through the skin, and you go right into the tendon using ultrasound. And it's an ultrasonic wave, if you will, that breaks up the bad collagen. Because the collagen that is diseased is more vulnerable, it responds preferentially to that treatment and gets destroyed and removed compared to healthy collagen. It doesn't have much as much of an effect on the healthy collagen. Then it stimulates a healing response. So patella tendonitis is otherwise known as jumper's knee. We see it a ton in the NBA and basketball. We get a lot of lost time um, uh, in basketball due to jumper's knee. 10X is one way to manage it with this needle technique where it's, there's this uh, sonic wave that goes into the area. Um, we sometimes use plate the rich plasma, physical therapy, straps called a show part strap across the knee. But patella tendonitis, just like this guy's seeing, can be really recalcitrant to treatment and can be a big challenge. And, and if this hasn't done it, there are other techniques. One caveat I would say, and we can certainly take another question, is that if there's a lot of soft tissue pain below the kneecap, the procedure tends to do better than when there's a lot of bony pain. When there's a lot of tenderness on the kneecap or the patella, my experience has been that this procedure doesn't do as well. So you can't just apply all the, you know, one technique. It's not a, a single hammer nail phenomenon. You got to really look at the patient and say, hey, is it on the bone? Is it in the soft tissue? Or is it both? And then we kind of pick our techniques to match the problem. Good stuff. Here's the next question, David from Lincoln Park. What? This is simple. What is runner's knee? So runner's knee is a pretty generic uh, diagnosis, and it can include patella tendinitis, include pain in the front of the knee going up and down stairs. Uh, but I'd say the most classic uh, problem with runner's knee is iliotibial band tendinitis. That's when uh, individuals have tightness on the outer side of their knee and their leg. and over Going the, up, up above the knee, right? Actually, just above or to the outer side. Okay. And with repetitive activities like running, the more you do, the worse it gets, and it gets very, very painful. I actually had it as a medical student, didn't know what it was. And it's one of those things that the, you don't, you can run to it, but you shouldn't run through it because it just gets more and more inflamed. So a runner's knee is a tight, often associated with a very tight iliotibial band, the tight fascia collagen structure on the outer, outer side of the knee. It responds very well to non-surgical treatments such as physical therapy and stretching and ice and making sure the individual doesn't run through it. You can run to it. That's one of the rules. It gets worse if you run on bank surfaces. It gets worse if you try a new pair of shoes, if you tend to be a pronator where your feet sort of turn in the, in the wrong direction. Uh, those are all things that can lead to runner's knee or iliotibial band tendinitis. Not a deal breaker. It just requires treatment. 
All right. It's uh, continuing on here with our Ask the Doctor segment. Steve Cashel, Dr. Brian Cole at Sports Medicine Weekly here on The Score. This one's from Jack asking you this. After a knee replacement, Dr. Cole, can you still do heavy squats, deadlifts, and jog? So the answer in part will depend upon, you know, you, you always, the, all, the caveat is always you got to talk to your doctor, right? Ask him that question. But I'll, but I'll tell you that in general, uh, in a normal situation with a knee replacement, it can tolerate a whole lot. Most of our guys would say you can play doubles tennis, you can ski blue runs, you can dance, you can get on an elliptical, you can use a bike. I would just like you to avoid ballistic activities, activities where the leg comes off the ground and pounds back down with high impact. Okay. So running, you can do it. It just it may impart more loads than the replacement would otherwise like to handle. So it's all about the amount of load that you put on it. But the other activities that, that he describes are generally just fine. You can do squats. You can do body weight exercises, things of that nature. I would just say where running is doable, you run the risk of, of causing uh, uh, high, high loads to the joint. All right, final question of the show it comes from Tim. I'm a 38-year-old male. I had a nagging uh, plantar fasciitis for the past year and a half. In October, I completely ruptured my plantar fascia and have been in a boot the last seven weeks, just starting to get around with it. My question is, Dr. Cole, what should I do in rehab and introducing running again to make sure the plantar fasciitis doesn't return? Well, Tim, the first thing is the best thing that's happened to you is that the plantar fascia ruptured because once that happens, that's sort of the road to recovery. So we'll often put people in a boot to get the quiet down the soft tissue swelling and so forth. But you're, gonna, you're on the road to getting better. So it's all about pain. And this could be six, eight, ten weeks uh, when the trauma of the rupture goes away. But it's okay to introduce running again into your uh, regimen when the discomfort starts to get better. You're, you can't make it worse. You just don't want to cause inflammation on a recent injury, if you will. But sometimes people can get it back within six to eight weeks after they rupture their plantar fascia when they've had longstanding plantar fasciitis, otherwise known as heel spurs. I remember that from the Joachim Noah injury. Yep. You know, it, it was almost like once it tore, it was a lot better. Yep, absolutely. All right, Dr. Cole, great stuff. We're out of time. Many thanks to our producer, Shane Reardon, our coordinating producer, Therese Ann Seeger. We also want to thank David Cole for managing our website and our business operations, as well as Samantha Smith from Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. For Dr. Brian Cole, I'm Steve Cashel saying so long. Thanks for listening to us on Sports Medicine Weekly here on 670 The Score. Up next on The Score, early odds with Joe Ostrowski. Talk with you again next Saturday at 8 a.m. Have a great weekend, everybody.